Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. Has the host unmuted? Is the video disabled? Dale, it's David Chu. You can just just mute yourself and turn off your video and turn it on when we're about to roll. You'll you'll I'll cue you. Hey all, we're about to start shortly. Gonna give it a few more minutes for the room to fill up. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be on in about two.
using this. A lot of people say it's racist. It's not racist at all. Chinese virus. Uh, it comes from China. Back against the Chinese virus. Here at home, Asian Americans are facing more than just the fear of contracting the virus. Chinese people, you think you're imperialists? They say that hurtful and misleading language from our nation's leaders are now making things worse. But every time I see a ch Chinese person, I go, <gasps> he said it's a Chinese virus. And it came from China. The Chinese are the worst ones. Sanitize your ass. Come here. You have corona. I'm sorry, man. Sorry. <laughs> the China virus. Man, I've got corona. Ching Chong too. Fucking coronavirus. You got corona. It's, it's, it's starting to piss me off. You make coronavirus. This Ching Chong virus. These labels and titles continuing to trigger acts of hate across the country. Fucking coronavirus. During times like this, it's not a time to be a racist or to discriminate. Trump's comments distance Asians from the rest of America and the rest of the world. By calling it the Chinese virus, he is perpetuating the fear, hatred, and in some cases, violence against Chinese and Asians worldwide. Shut up. The virus doesn't care about race or gender, religion, sexual orientation. Only we seem to care about that. We just got to do better. At this moment in life, let's all be one race. That's just, you know, it's, it's just disgusting. It's wrong. It's not a Chinese virus. It is absolutely wrong and inappropriate to call this the Chinese coronavirus. Then we there. need to be, again, allies to our, our Asian friends. I'm going to dedicate this to all of the Asian Pacific American healthcare workers who are putting their lives on the line, even as they have to face race. Sadly, some of us lash out on Asian Americans as if Asian Americans were responsible for this virus, except for being of Asian descent. Stop it. Acts of violence against Asian Americans will not stop the spread of this virus. So, the next time you wash your hands, wash out the hate that you may have for your fellow Americans. Hate will get you sick, even if the virus doesn't. Hello. Can everybody see me? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Jeff Yang, cultural critic and CNN contributor, moderator for this, the first of four national town halls we've organized to elevate the conversation about the impact of COVID-19 on our APA communities. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I first, before anything else, want to recognize the over 70 organizations and leaders who have signed on as supporters for RISE Asian Pacific America. Now I'd like to introduce our group who have come together to make these town halls happen, beginning with Michelle Wu. Michelle. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Jeff. We're so excited to be here with you. Uh, the spark for the creation of this town hall series came out of an ongoing conversation among Asian American state and local elected officials representing our APA communities that have been deeply impacted by both COVID-19 and the racism that has come in its wake. Our view of this crisis is from the ground up. And what we've seen has prompted us to bring together a team of like-minded leaders and organizers to initiate this national dialogue. David. Good afternoon. Today in this first session, we want to shine a bright spotlight on the human and social impacts of COVID-19 on Asian Pacific Americans who've been attacked not just by the coronavirus, but by the virus of racism, prompted by leadership at the very highest levels of our government. Yulene. Oops, muted. Hey everyone, we are bringing together policy leaders, activists and organizers, academics and artists for this conversation because this isn't just a political issue. The way we're being impacted by COVID-19 today is being deeply shaped by how we're perceived in media, by racial and class dynamics, and by the ways that immigrants are used and exploited to keep our nation's economic engine turning. And Fu. In future sessions, we will be digging deeper into the historical context that led us to this moment and looking down 
to where we need to go next, both to recover from a cultural and economic consequence of this pandemic and to build stronger bridges to other communities. Because our goal isn't just to get back to normal, it's get back to better. Sharon. The next three events will take place every Friday in May, same virtual place, same time. We'll continue to update information about these upcoming town halls and future activities on a regular basis at our website, www.riseapa.org or via our Twitter handle at riseapa.org. We hope you'll join us for those. And remember, invite your friends to attend as well. Thanks so much, Michelle, David, Yulene, Fu, and Sharon. Now we'd like to begin our program with a very special guest. Uh, you know him from stage, from screen, uh, and he is truly one of our icons of our culture, uh, playwright David Henry Huang, whose latest work, Soft Power, was just named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Welcome to our virtual stage, David. David, thank you so much for joining us from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, honestly, it is uh, so critical to hear your voice in this particular conversation. You have such a unique view of our present landscape, in part because your latest work, Soft Power, is focused on US perceptions of China and Chinese perceptions of the US. Uh, could you share with us some of your thoughts about what's happening in America today? And in particular, the rhetoric being used around China that we're seeing and, and the degree to which it matters to us as Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks so much for organizing this, which is an amazing effort and really important uh, for all of us. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of the rhetoric against China right now, um, particularly coming from, I think, the highest levels of the administration um, has to do with sort of shifting blame and um, finding uh, an enemy. Um, and it is we, there is certainly time to argue about uh, the measures that China took when this, um, when this broke out. And they may have made some mistakes and I think we should be honest about that. But more importantly as Americans, we need to acknowledge our own mistakes and the mistakes that our government made, which um, it may come out when this is all done. I think our mistakes may have been uh, substantially greater certainly if measured by the casualty toll and the death toll that we've uh, ex uh, experienced so far even. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of blaming China right now for political gain and to try and change the subject away from the administration's failings. And unfortunately, we as Asian Americans get caught in that crossfire. Crossfire is devastating. I mean, it's devastating, not just in terms of the direct impact of the disease, but the economic impact as well. And of course, uh, the impact of xenophobia, as we've seen in that video, on individual Asians. Uh, what we saw is that even before the casualty started to mount, we, we saw slurs beginning to spread, slanders about hygiene, about uh, Asian immigrants as disease carriers, uh, about our diet, right? a pretty constant uh, source of, of condemnation and mockery for Asians since basically the dawn of our immigration. Um, how do you think that these have contributed to the climate of resentment and hatred that we're starting to see today? Well, I mean, it's very discouraging and, uh, you know, really sort of pisses me off the degree <laughs> to which uh, anti-Asian hate has uh, resurfaced so strongly uh, in such a short period of time. And it really reinforces uh, and is yet more proof of the degree to which Asian Americans are still perpetual foreigners. Um, and therefore, you know, it would have been just as racist and wrong and ignorant to have blamed African Americans during the Ebola pandemic. Um, but Asians somehow get blamed because we are still associated with our home countries, our countries of origin, our root countries, as opposed to being considered Americans. 
Um, so it's, it's very, it's, it's discouraging. And I think that in a way it shows the failure of the model minority mindset that somehow if we try to placate um, white racism, white supremacy, then we are going to be immune from racism. You can see you, this is an example of how it just flips at any moment uh, when the majority culture decides that we're not uh, being sufficiently obedient or that we are somehow the enemy. And I don't want to say speaking of white supremacy and white racism, <laughs> but we're seeing that a lot of this language, the rhetoric uh, and even new policies are being directed from the very top of our government. You mentioned before, uh, you know, leading members of the GOP, President Trump himself are, are directing this rhetoric. And one of the things which comes out of this, of course, is fear and hatred. Uh, and again, this fear and hatred ends up cascading not just to Chinese Americans, but anybody who looks like somebody who's an other. Uh, I know it's kind of a, a painful memory for you to discuss, but just uh, some years back, it, it's something you actually included uh, in the conversation in, in your work, Soft Power. Uh, you yourself were assaulted and, and could actually have easily lost your life in an attack that took place in Brooklyn. Um, and there's some question as to what the motivation was, but it very well could have been racially motivated. What does it feel like now, looking back at that moment from the vantage point of today? Does it do anything to shape your perspective and the fears that many other Asian Americans are experiencing right now? Well, I, like a lot of other um, Asian Americans in recent months, have also experienced aggression um, just uh, based on my race and someone, uh, uh, another patient yelled at me um, in a hospital uh, really like two months ago now when I was just in for a checkup. Um, but it did kind of trigger um, memories of having been, had a major assault, the one that you referenced uh, several years ago when um, an unknown assailant snuck up behind me uh, at about 9 p.m. on my block in Brooklyn and stabbed me in the neck. Uh, and severed my vertebral artery. Uh, and I ended up walking to Brooklyn Hospital, which is just about two blocks away from my house, unfortunately. Um, and I did, as you mentioned, incorporate that into my newest show, Soft Power. And one of the things I realized as I was working on Soft Power is the extent to which I wasn't willing to admit to myself um, as a person that my attack might have been racially motivated, that it might have been a hate crime. And in some sense, I had to work it out by putting it into my show. Um, and my collaborators were, you know, kept sort of pushing me, like, take your stabbing, take the stabbing in the play more seriously. Um, and I came out of the experience realizing, you know, I was feeling ashamed, uh, the, the possibility that I might be the victim of a racial attack. Uh, made me feel shame. And I find that really kind of fascinating. Like, why is it that if you're the victim of racism, you feel shame as opposed to the, uh, the racist who's the person who should actually be ashamed? It's not on us to feel shame. It's not on us to try to be more American. It's on all of us to try to find a better way of resolving this and addressing this. And you know, hearing your insights has been so important, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to keep on going with this conversation and Great. keep on listening, hopefully, for what you have to share. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to actually pass the mic now to Carlin Cohen of the Chinese American Planning Council, who's going to facilitate a special activity for all of us. Thank you, Jeff. We know that there's a lot of information being thrown our way these days, so much so that it can be kind of difficult to process when we aren't giving ourselves the space and time to do so. So we'd like to try a little experiment tonight. Take a few seconds to think about one phrase, just one, that describes how you're feeling about the state of Asian Pacific America today. No wrong answers. Now, let's unpack that word. Take a few seconds to explain why that one phrase describes how you're feeling. You can write out full sentences, jot down bullets, draw a picture, however you process best. I'm gonna give you a few seconds of background music to get your thinking juices going. Feel free to type your response in that box or some comments if you'd like to show them.
Great. I hope that was enough time for you. And I encourage you to go back and finish your thoughts after the town hall if you didn't get a chance to finish. Now, if you're open to sharing with all of us, please text your phrase to 22333. We'll show a word cloud that pulls together the words for all of us we're thinking about at the end of this session. With that, let me pass the mic over to New York State Assembly member Yulin Yu to lead a conversation about the real world impact of COVID-19 xenophobia. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Yulene New, and I actually represent Lower Manhattan in the New York State Assembly. And that's District 65 for folks that don't know, but it is actually representing also Chinatown in New York. So uh, first, I wanted to thank you, Jeff. Um, now that we have a top level view of what our communities look like, where we are, and what has really brought us to this moment, uh, let's take a closer look at how hate incidents and hate crimes have really impacted us in different parts of the country. We've invited some impacted individuals, uh, folks in our community that uh, would like to share their stories today. And so first I wanted to introduce Helen. She's a senior at Columbia who hopes to become a legal champion for women's rights. Helen, can you tell us what happened a few weeks ago? Hi guys, uh, so what happened was on March 2nd, I was on my way to work. Uh, since I'm a rising senior, I took the number one train at the 116th Street to uh, 42nd Times Square. And uh, since it was the, in the beginning of COVID-19, I wasn't wearing a uh, I was wearing a mask, but not so many people are wearing a mask. Um, but I didn't want to trigger, you know, unwanted frustrations or feelings. So I was wearing a scarf on top of my mask. Um, as I was waiting for the train, um, I saw this man walking back and forth in front of me in a very um, unfriendly way, and I got really scared because. Uh, uh, I've seen news that people being pushed uh, or being attacked in the subway. However, fortunately, the train came and I, as I was walking into the train before I could stand still, uh, I feel this very strong punch in, behind my back. And uh, because it's, the force is so strong, I couldn't help but lean a little bit over. And this lady who's sitting in front of me uh, just said to me, you know, um, uh, get out get out of my way. And um, uh, so I have to move one step next to her. And then I, you know, try to turn around and see, you know, who did this to me, but uh, everybody turned their back on me. So I didn't know who did this. Um, that was my experience. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Yeah. Um, so Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, I know it's really hard to share all the details over and over and over again. So I wanted to say thank you for sharing that experience. Um, next, I wanted to introduce Kyle, a queer uh, Filipinx American child of immigrants and a registered nurse in San Francisco. Kyle, are you there? Yeah, um, good evening, everybody. I'm Kyle Navarro, I use he, him pronouns. Um, in uh, late March, after shelter in place was enacted in my area, I had uh, dropped off a postal package of prescription glasses to send to a manufacturer to mail exchange a broken pair for one of our students that needed them. And, uh, you know, upon returning to my bicycle, as I was kneeling on the sidewalk to unlock it, I, I noticed an older white man was walking by staring at me and I, I decided to brush it off initially. And he ended up walking past me and he looked back and then he spat in my direction. And, you know, thankfully it didn't hit me, but as he was walking by, he called me a racial slur and he began to walk away. And, you know, in that moment, I, I was hit with a wave of emotions and like anger, sadness and fear. And, you know, after taking a moment to breathe and assess the situation I was in and reground myself, you know, I just, I yelled back, no, thank you as he walked away. And, you know, after the incident, I, I took to Twitter to just chronicle my experience, to just find community and let my friends and chosen family know what happened to me and just to process through it and have a dialogue. And, you know, afterwards, and just as my experience as an Asian American person, you know, it's really made me be aware of, you know, 
even more so than I already have the experiences of other communities and how you know we have to continually process our ways of feeling through all this. And as bad as I feel, I I have to honor what we feel and what our communities feel. But keep in mind as well the you know the suffering that the Black community has been feeling and disproportionately affected with racist murders, like the recent murder of Ahmad Arbery being broadcast, or the narratives by our country's leaders around like post 9/11 Islamophobic narratives or the historical erasure of Indigenous peoples' narratives. And you know these are the things that I, as an Asian American, don't have to deal with thanks to the privilege of being Asian American and the historical benefits that come with our proximity to whiteness and the model minority myth. And I think it's important that we as a community continue to actively and visibly uplift the voices of people in all marginalized community. And at the same time, recognize when we take up too much space in conversations when we should allow the people directly affected to have the mic. And I think one of the important things we should do is have these kind of conversations with our families, our friends, and with ourselves around racism, anti-blackness, queer phobia, um, that we ourselves may be perpetuating. Thank you. Um, Kyle, before you, um, you know, mute yourself, I just, first off, um, other folks in my community have said very similar stories, healthcare workers, essential workers. Um, how does that make you feel on that level? I mean, I just, I feel personally that, you know, when you're sacrificing your own life every single day, that must have been particularly difficult. Yeah, yeah, you know, as just a healthcare worker and, you know, among one of the many on the different parts of the front lines, like it, it, that was a tipping point for me. You know, I, I had broken down when I had gotten home safe after that. And just, you know, it, it really put in perspective, just, you know, the importance of holding community and space and checking in with anybody, healthcare or otherwise, that is out there and having to go through everything going out there. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, first off, I just want to acknowledge that our essential workers are from our communities of color and so often we forget them in our policies and our governing, et cetera. And, um, you know, as the district that, uh, ha you know, had 9-11 happen to it, uh, Sandy, um, we always say that we want to acknowledge our heroes, but often, often we forget. So um, I just wanted to uh, recognize also uh, Annie, who's a mother of a college age daughter who will be speaking on her behalf and Crystal, her interpreter. Annie, are you there? Annie? Yeah. Uh, oh, I got you. Oh, I got you. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Um, yeah, make sure that um, the the microphone needs to uh, be away from one another a little bit. Um, and I think that uh, we need to make sure that we're muting one person. Is it okay? okay. It's, it's, no, sorry, it's not. Okay. Um, Annie, you sign one. You can use this phone. You can use this iPad. Okay. 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 Um, please just log into one device. I think that we can use one device. Yong Ika So Ji Ho the Ika Dianao Bia Yong Yanga. Yo Ika Xiao Guan Dia. Annie, Ni Zai Ma. Annie, are you there? Okay, so I'm just gonna um, skip to the next person um, while they fix the microphone for Annie. Um, next, we have Amanda, a graduate student. Amanda, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Amanda, thank you for joining us today. Yes. Uh, so my story was, um, it's actually start actually happened on April 19th around 9 a.m. in the morning. So I was just walking my two dogs on the Great Highway Trail as usual. And this woman suddenly um, just kind of approached me from behind. And she started asking me um, by saying that, oh, why didn't you stay at home? You are supposed to stay at home. And I think she was referring to the uh, shelter in place directive at that time. Um, so I kind of just ignore her because I can tell that she, I could tell that she's a little bit unstable. So um, I, I kind of just ignore her and keep walking. But then she just pick up her pace and then she followed me closer and closer. And um, it was difficult because I have two dogs in my hand and they are already really agitated because 
um, they're just being, they were being protective. They thought this woman's going to attack me. Um, so I didn't want anyone to be, you know, to get beaten by any chance, um, you know, but at the same time, she wouldn't leave me alone. So she start really like raising her voice and um, start yelling right like, racial slurs. Um, so stuff like, oh, we don't want you here. Um, that's why we elected, you know, the current president. Um, she was getting so close to me that she actually spat a little bit on my face. Um, at this point, I was pretty much cornered. Um, so I have to like, just, you know, turn my back at her because I don't want her to like keep spitting at me. Um, she's also getting more and more physical, like she reach out her arms at me and, and all that stuff. So fortunately, a few people step in and then help me out. They eventually was able to like escort her away. And a few other people actually stopped by and, and asked if I was okay. And, and I was. Um, so I walked home, I contacted the police and um, filed a police report. And then, um, you know, share the uh, events on Facebook, um, you know, just so people know what's happened. And um, yeah, like I decided to share the story not to like not to spread hate and division, but I just really want to educate and raise awareness that um, people know that actually this is happening like right now in San Francisco one of the most diverse cities in the country. So if you're being harassed, just, you know, make sure that you know how to handle the situation properly with safety as your top priority. And if you see someone being harassed, like really importantly is do not hesitate to like, you know, step in and, and help in a safe way. So I think that's the most important message I want to convey. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's so important when we have allies and we have uh, bystander upstander trainings that are all around the country. And so hopefully um, people are uh, understanding what it feels like when we have support and backup. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so I wanted to bring, um, since I think that we're still working on Annie's translator, um, can we bring in Donaline and her daughter, Charlize? Um, are you guys there? Oh, so cute. Oh my gosh. Hi. Hi. You're cute. <laughs> <laughs> They're like twins. <laughs> um, hi. So my name is Donaline. Uh, this is my daughter, Charlize. Hello. Um, so uh, we want to talk about what happened on April 2nd. I might need to read a little bit because I go off on a tangent sometimes. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so it was me, my daughter, and my mom. My mom's 65 years old. Um, my daughter is 17. I'm 41. Um, we decided to... <laughs> How are you 41? We decided to take... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we decided to take a walk um, with our dogs in Oceanside, California, um, and uh, we had worn masks. Uh, it was kind of like the beginning of like wearing your mask in public, and we just thought it was a good idea. Uh, so we did, and not even five minutes, uh, a car drove by and yelled out the window, uh, you started the coronavirus. And you could hear them just, you know, kind of being negative. And so they, we had to yell, we had to say something. We said, don't be racist. Yeah. Um, and they turned around the corner uh, and we decided to walk back um, mm -hmm. home because we were like, oh, I just don't feel safe anymore. So we decided to turn around and walk home. And we saw them unloading their car. And uh, the, it was a male, it was two males, a female and two young kids. One was a baby and one was probably about four. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I, I couldn't not say anything. So I, I had to say something and I felt like if I didn't, then it, it wasn't really standing up for us and the Asian people. So I just said, you know, for your information, my dad fought for this country. I'm a nurse and I'm Filipino and you really shouldn't be teaching this to your kids. And the, the driver um, kind of looked at me and was kind of going like this because I kind of felt like he felt bad or kind of realized. He just was like, be quiet kind of a way, kind of a thing. But it was his wife or girlfriend who was holding the baby that started to egg the situation on and mm -hmm. escalating it. So she can tell you what happened after that. Yeah, so when the wife started to 
say a lot more and more um, racial slurs and just use like words that were not appropriate, I decided to step in at that time because it was towards my mom and my grandmother. So I began to like get frustrated and I started shaking and I just felt like I was boiling inside. So I had to say stuff. Yeah. And then the wife began to threaten me as she was holding her baby in her arms. She was threatening to fight me and I and it was just interesting because I'm 17 and this is a grown woman like just pushing past like everything that's like human to try to like fight me I guess and and then I like started to realize that I need to like back out like because I don't know what they have I don't know what could go down I don't know what could happen to my family so we decided to walk away like both sides were still exchanging words and um that's I I feel like my advice or with this experience is to do everything you can to escalate it um, because you don't know if they have a gun or what. And I have a feeling they had parked in front of their house. So, and it's right by my mom's house and I didn't really want any issues with her and her neighbors. Um, so yeah. I, so we kind of, we, we just kind of turned our backs and went the other way and um, my advice is if it gets really bad is to actually call the police at, during the actual event. Mm -hmm. um, because I, from what I hear from another friend is that they don't take a statement from you if it, if the situation has passed. Yeah. Um, so it's really, it's really important to do the call at the time that it's happening. And so, also to record. To record. I didn't have my phone. She had hers, but we... For some reason, it was moment. so fast that we didn't even record it. But, you know, it's, it's what it is. So a lot of other folks um, put things on social media. Like, how did you get your story out and who did you report it to? Um, I decided to record a video and discuss what happened so that not only um, other adults knew, but my peers as well. And I posted it on my social media account discussing and like raising awareness. So. Yeah, so did so did I, and um, a really good friend of mine got wind of it and passed it on to you folks. <laughs> so thank you for all that you're doing for us. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna try again to connect with Annie later, but okay. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story. I want to acknowledge first and foremost that it takes so much courage and um, and and. And having to relive things over and over and over again, it takes a lot. It, it's a lot of yeah. Trauma. I'm a little shaky, like just talking about it. <laughs> I just really appreciate that yeah. folks are willing to speak about what's going on. And um, you know, we're gonna come back to um, you know Annie and our yeah. other friend Jiayang in a little bit. But I wanted to just uh, bring in uh, our other guest. And so, thank you so much to the two of you for sharing your story. I'm so sorry that thank we. Thank everyone. You know, thank you. Yeah, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Sorry. Um, and I wanted to bring in our next guest, um, somebody I actually shared a Zoom call with very recently, Cynthia Choi, the co-director for um, the Chinese for Affirmative Action in San Francisco. And she's a collaborative partner of Stop Anti-AAPI Hate, which is a national incident reporting website um, developed to track stories just like the ones that we just heard. And um, I just wanted to say again to all of the folks who were willing to speak today, um, your stories are the ones that we have to go through every day. I mean, my own office got calls saying that I ate bats and that I needed to bring a walk to work so that I could fry up some cats and dogs. So um, this is, um, it's getting to a point where we really, really needed to make sure that we were documenting these stories. So Cynthia, um, can you share more about how this project started and what trends that you're seeing? Cynthia, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you again. Yes. We've, we've done this before. Um, well, first, I just want to take a moment to thank all the community members tonight for bravely sharing their story. It's not easy. And unfortunately, uh, these stories that you've just heard reflect the hundreds that we've received through our Stop API Hate initiative. Um, and over the last seven weeks, um, we've received over 1,700 incidents that are just as harrowing, traumatizing, and dehumanizing 
and they're directed at um, Asians. So as you can see, they're coming from all over the country. Um, we have some of the highest incident reports coming from regions with um, large API populations. Um, we're learning about accounts of individuals being harassed, physically attacked, denied goods and services, and experiencing discrimination at all levels. And this is why we're sheltering in place. Um, and as you heard from all of the, pan uh, the community members, all APIs are being targeted, including our most vulnerable members of our community. You can change to the, the next slide. So you can see that we have um, elderly um, women and youth who are encountering this, these experiences. And of course, again, as I mentioned, all APIs are being directed, but it's certainly based on the accounts that we receive, the intended target are Chinese um, and, and, they're being, and we're all blamed, blamed um, for this coronavirus. So, um, you know, just what I wanted to end up saying is that, so what do we wanna do as individuals, as communities, and what can we expect from our government? And especially as the economy starts to open up, how do we prepare for the potential for a, a surge in attacks, but also all the ways in which our communities were hurting before the pandemic and as a result of this public health crisis um, and economic crisis. So um, I just wanna thank you for this opportunity. I think this is an important conversation um, that we're having. We need to forcefully counter this um, propaganda and misinformation uh, that's fueling the anti-Asian racism. And we need to all come together and build solidarity within our community and across our communities. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That's such incredible and um, important work. And I just wanted to thank you for establishing this website to help all of us policymakers uh, to actually develop these strategic responses to address these challenges. And um, we're gonna transition now actually to David Chu, who will actually lead a discussion about why this is happening now. David? Hey, I see you. Thanks, running. Elaine. Good evening, everyone. Really appreciate all of you joining us. I'm David Chu, I'm a state legislator in California. I'm chair of the California API Legislative Caucus and I also represent San Francisco, including Chinatown, Japantown, uh, Little Saigon and our Manila Town Heritage District. Um, we're gonna have a, a short conversation by a couple of folks uh, who've been working in these issues on why this is happening. I wanna welcome our guest, uh, Dale Manami, who's a nationally recognized attorney, a civil rights icon. He led the team that brought justice to Japanese internment survivor, Fred Korematsu. Uh, I'm also gonna bring on uh, Bo Tao Uribe, who's the co-founder and executive director of the Coalition of Asian American Leaders in Minnesota, and also a former Obama appointee to the White House Initiative on API. So uh, welcome, Dale, uh, welcome, Bo. Hopefully you guys are joining. I'm, I'm joining All now. Right. <laughs> oh, can we, yeah. Dale, are you there? I'm here, I think. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can see you. Great. Um, so let me just pose my, my first question. Both of you have incredible records of doing work in our community uh, for many, many decades. Um, and you both come at it from different arenas. You've seen your share of injustices perpetrated against our communities. You know, from your perspective, maybe I'll ask Dale the first question. What's unique about this moment? Why do you think this is happening right now in 2020? Well, part, part of it is not unique. I mean, the rivers of racism in this country run deep and have run long for a long period of time. And sometimes you hit the perfect storm like we have now and they overflow when you have wars or national security crises, or in this case, a pandemic recession uh, the rivers then overflow and cause these ugly incidents. I think, um, like I said, we hit the perfect storm. And, and in this case, uh, we have a novel disease with no cure that spreads easily. We have a re racist president who's encouraging and normalizing hate against people of color and immigrants, giving a green light for people to commit these heinous acts. And also a party that needs to cover his failure to ameliorate the worst pandemic uh, pandemic in modern history by blaming somebody, and that's blaming Japan. And like David said, there's room for criticism, but at the same time, 
you know, this is a distraction. This is an attempt to uh, essentially get reelected, I think. And the problem uh, in my mind is that this is an election year. This is like 1942 when Earl Warren was running for governor and he demonized Japanese Americans, which al allowed the government to send 120,000 to, to prisons. This is, uh, you know, that was his platform. That was his playbook. And that's the same playbook now to win the election, divide Americans, create the chaos. And of course, the greater danger is not just to, you know, people of color or Asian Americans, it's the threat to a democracy by sowing the chaos and the division. Thank you. Um, Bo, I'm gonna ask you the same question from your perspective. What's unique about this moment now in 2020? Sure, I mean, I think um, Dale is right in terms of, uh, you know, when we have national leaders who scapegoat uh, a community yeah. and then also just a government, um, government leaders that fail and people are angry and scared and then that, um, that okay to target, a, I think a specific community really um, sets us up for this moment. And I, and then, you know, I think I also wanna point out that we have an education system that has not taught us about the U.S.'s history of racism and xenophobia. And so um, people don't know enough, even though we want them to know more about how racism has worked in the past and um, how our, uh, our communities have collectively suffered. Um, I think that uh, so much of that is not in place. And so this complexity uh, then ends up in this moment when there is global pain uh, because of a pandemic and people are angry and scared and worried. And then that target, um, our community becomes a scapegoat. And I think that that, yeah. uh, that creates this moment for, for us and what we're facing. That's for sure. Um, so let me ask both of you one more question, which is, uh, you know, many of us are thinking about what activism means today and activism has meant different things over the years. What do you think it means today? What is it about today's activism that makes you hopeful that maybe we can have a shot at actually changing this for the better? Oh, sure. I, I think, you know, what, what we have today is a much more diverse Asian American community. And I think that that diversity is really being embraced, but also we are defining ourselves as uh, in the context of being Americans and talking about what it is we want for our country. And, you know, I've been in the field for a long time, like many others. And so just, I do think that there is a readiness in terms of putting together strategies that combined organizing um, service to community policy research that um, we haven't always had. And so I feel like we are much more um, better position, even though there is a lot of hurt. Um, I feel like the community is coming together and there is a readiness and communities uh, on the local level are doing a lot. And so we have a lot to learn and we have the ability to not only talk nationally about what's happening, but to thread across the country so that communities, as you heard uh, Cindy say, uh, from their data, this is not just happening in one, one area, it's happening all across the country. And we need to make sure that uh, we are strong our infrastructure is strong and that um, we talk about what it means to be Asian Americans fighting uh, racism. And I think we are starting to do that. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you, Bill. I'm gonna ask the same question to Dale. Dale, um, give us your thoughts on, on activism today that should give us or hopefully gives us some hope for the future. Well, I, I could just say ditto. I think what Bo said was, was right on. I think what I see too though, besides groups coming together, we have demographics, we have a lot more population, we have a lot more people who now perceive a threat, uh, not just to their survival, but I mean, to their survival, but also their physical well-being. Um, and it reminds me a little bit about uh, years ago during the redress movement, we see allies or the civil rights movements where we are now seeing allies of all colors coming together, but it takes the education for us to explain what happened to us that or what is happening to us. In my community, there are folks organizing now to take uh, some of the Hollaback uh, seminars because, and these are Caucasians, Jewish Americans, because they wanna support us. The other thing I see is, and I hope this happens because a number of different organizations 
are coming together to create uh, uh, convocations like this. And I hope at some point they can combine or come together or organize together to form a much stronger one uh, organization. There are also politicians that we've never had before, Asian American or the years I grew up, because I'm pretty damn old, but see these Asian American politicians stand up. And finally, I, it's really nice to see the individuals here today standing up and resisting. And, uh, and I'm inspired by their courage to speak out and to stand up and that, you know, we're not gonna take this crap anymore. So uh, with that kind of attitude, I do think that's the hope that I have with the organizations and individuals. Dale, both, thank you. I uh, just have to say, Dale, your tagline, we're not gonna take this crap anymore. That might be I think, <laughs> today's town hall. It just um, came out of somewhere. <laughs> I'm mad, I'm just angered. <laughs> I just wanna thank, you know, I have to admit, I, I may have uh, put into the cloud uh, the word angry, and I suspect that many of us who are uh, who are yeah. thinking and reflecting on this is, are certainly feeling that as an emotion. Uh, but I will just say, as an elected official, I want to thank Bo and Dale, and I know we've got hundreds of community activists who are sharing with us who are part of this town hall, and and all of you are fighting in so many places around the country. I just want to thank you for that, and and frankly, paving the way for uh, a newer generation of elected leaders. Uh, uh, like some of the folks uh, who have helped pull this together to move forward. So, so yeah. thank you for your very thoughtful discussion. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to more conversations. Thank you. So with this, uh, we're gonna continue the conversation on this topic. Uh, we have comedian, writer, actress, Jenny Yang, and uh, also Pulitzer Prize winning author, Viet Thanh Nguyen. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeff Yang to facilitate this discussion. Jeff, now to you. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, Jenny and Viet. Viet, do we have you? Hey, Jeff. Can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you and see you. Uh, and Jenny. Uh, Hi. <laughs> I love the background. Happy uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Just wanted to represent the boba of my people. <laughs> well, I want to represent our fellow Vietnamese American, Kelly Marie yes. uh, Star Wars. <laughs> Listen, all we're doing is shout outs for this whole thing. Yeah. Oh, wearing a Win coffee supply shirt from my friend Sara Win, her uh, small roastery in independent roastery in New York because I'm now with the esteemed uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen. <laughs> well, they sent me free coffee, but they didn't send me a t-shirt, so I'm jealous. Well, I, I bought this, okay, and they did not pay me <laughs> because we are out here during APA Heritage Month trying to support businesses, okay? I know, but you're supposed to be an Asian American influencer. You get some stuff for free, like a t-shirt. <laughs> oh God, no, I, I bought this, you guys. This My, my lifestyle is a sham. You, whatever you think it is, it's not. It's as glamorous oh, no, no, no. as it appears. <laughs> we have to ourselves. We're the Asian American influencers and we're trying to influence this conversation on COVID and representation. Mm. And oh, we're yeah. here to talk about model minorities and perpetual foreigners, right, Jeff? We are indeed. And uh, thank you guys for uh, giving us a moment of levity, a much needed one, uh, as well as uh, some, uh, some nice uh, sponsor moments, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wanted to actually uh, bring it back to that topic. Uh, both of you guys obviously speak to this larger question about the perceptions that shape the way people think of us and even act towards us in your own distinctive ways through prose, through humor, uh, and through your outspoken presences online. And we really wanted to ask you guys to, to share your thoughts on this duality of stereotypes you, you raised, Viet. Uh, one of them paints us as a minority that all other minorities should aspire to, that uh, you know, essentially is uh, adjacent to whiteness, uh, privileged in that fashion. But then the other frames us as never truly being American, never truly being assimilable. So what's behind the perpetuation of these stereotypes and how are they impacting us now, especially in the time of COVID? Well, I'll I think the you. Types, I'll uh, yeah. they perpetu I'm sorry if I jumped the gun, but they endure no, it's they all good. <laughs> because of basically racism and capitalism. That's what makes America great. It's racism and capitalism have been with us since the very origins of American society and they have produced a whole system of racial exploitation. So that's why Asian Americans exist. I mean, in an ideal American society where everyone's equal, we wouldn't need to have hyphenated Americans or adjective Americans, but we do. And we are never going to get away from this problem of the binary of model minorities and perpetual foreigners until we do away with a system of racial and capitalist exploitation. If we only talk about it as if, oh, you know, if we just were better Americans or if we just try to improve the system a little bit, we'll be okay. History has, has shown that not to be the case. And COVID 
demonstrates this. Every time there's a problem that people associate with Asians, whether it's a disease or whether it's economic competition, the accomplishments that Asian Americans think they have accumulated just vanish and we become once again an evil foreign threat, even if we're American citizens. So it's absolutely crucial, obviously, to try to address the short-term problems that we're confronting. But if we do not recognize the deep systemic issues into which we're embedded and fight those issues, we're never going to escape this binary that we're confronted with periodically. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's 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 a word right there. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, it's our job. It's a bunch of Asian Pacific American leaders on this Zoom meeting. And I think it's our job to uh, spread the analysis that's correct. You know what I mean? That it's not about trying to like get that A plus. Like, you know, this isn't Kumon. Like, racism, you can't, you know, get a test out of this, you know, to win. Like the, the system that we've uh, inherited is made to dehumanize us when we are not a part of the white supremacist system, you know, that when we're not the rulers and we're not the, the, the main beneficiaries of the system. And so uh, no matter what we do, we will be dehumanized. No matter what we do, okay, we're gonna be used to divide and conquer uh, everyone but those who are in power. And unfortunately, as much as Asian Americans wanna make our money, you know, yelp our food, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, get a nice fade with your nice corporate haircut job, whatever. Like, I remember those you, jobs. <laughs> you know, you can't, we can't get a straight A out of this. You know what I'm saying? So I, I just feel like we, I, I personally feel like there's also a, a deeply embedded in our Asian American community, a sense of uh, self-centered resentment around Asians not being recognized as being racist against which I think is a problem. Now, we can complain all the time that we don't get enough airtime to, 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 to recognize our issues, right, by the general public. But I think it, as a starting point, as a community, we need to address those in our community who are out here trying to uh, sort of use this kind of resentment that, oh, oh, black people, brown people, they don't see us as people of color or they don't stand up for us. That, that kind of attitude is so negative and toxic. I think it is our job as if you consider yourself an Asian American leader um, to speak up and educate our own Asian American community that that's not the way to start, that we need to build solidarity, that we need to come up with a, a, an attitude of openness and support and show up for other people mm -hmm. so that they can show up for us. You know, that's something which uh, when I shared my own incident, uh, with harassment uh, some time ago, a lot of people, uh, African-American and, and Latinx people chimed in and said, you know, we really feel for you, uh, but at the same time, kind of welcome to what it's like for us 24 seven, 365, right? Yes. So there's, there's definitely a sense in which uh, the, the access to privilege is something that goes away fast, but allyship, you know, kind of building bridges before things go wrong, that can last a lot longer. Um, do you guys have any additional thoughts in terms of uh, how we might be able to actually redress this? I mean, especially in this time, which is a time of crisis for us and one that, especially as November gets closer, is likely to even get sharper. Well, the reason I wore this t-shirt is because representations matter. That's a slogan that's been going around. And I think I absolutely believe that we need our actors, we need our politicians, we need our faces in high places and so on. But in the end, what really matters is power. You know, it doesn't really matter, you know, if we have Kelly Marie Tran, an actress in Star Wars, if we don't have the power to make movies. It really doesn't matter if we have Andrew Yang as a face for us, if we don't have political power, structural power, economic power. And so we all have a role to play in this. Uh, we all have our, our, our capacity to exercise power, as so many of our community members uh, were, testimony or were, were testifying to, that we can seize power when we have the opportunity in the individual circumstances, but we also need to fight for power through organization, through activities like this, through campaigns, through Asian American movements, through allyship, as you pointed out, nothing's gonna change until we have the power. Yeah, um, I agree with that, definitely. I feel like number one, we need to see ourselves as worthy of sharing our stories. I was so um, inspired by the courage of the people who shared their stories uh, earlier in this call about how, what discrimination they've experienced, you know, what kind of, you know, bystander support they've offered. And I think, you know, even on an individual le level, we need to be able to feel like we have the right to take a recording of ourselves and share it on social media because we have that power now. And, and I think as Asian Americans, we need to 
stand in that power and, sh and say that we can speak up, we can speak up for ourselves, but also importantly, speak importantly. up for others. Because I think that's what we need to do. We need to connect our story with others so that we have the strength and numbers to get that power. power. And demand that we could ask, demand political change, that we can ask for <laughs> accountability for the kind of policies and the climate that we're living in right now. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, especially for speaking a little bit of truth, maybe hard truth to all of us. Uh, it's been incredibly thought provoking, a great way to round out tonight's segment. And I'd like to now close this out by handing things back over to David and Yulene. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you so much to both of our speakers for um, giving us some of that perspective. I just hope that, you know, everybody's feeling what I'm feeling, which is that, you know, this today's town hall um, really helped to lay some groundwork for um, where we're at in America today. And um, I hope that it also gave folks, um, you know, a, a new perspective to think about. And I hope that, you know, we're creating a sense of community because I'm gonna tell you that I feel a little bit less alone. And I, I just want to um, let you all know that you're not alone and we see you, we're here and we wanna support one another. So um, David, I just wanted to say that coast to coast, man, <laughs> we got this. <laughs> From California, I also want to thank uh, Jenny and Beard and those comments. I feel like uh, there have been a lot of Jedi Knights that are fighting battles in your local communities around the country. And this is a coming together to say, you know what? It may feel like there's a dark evil empire out there, but we are coming together and we're going to strike back. Um, one of the things that we want to do as part of this close is to share the word cloud of phrases that were submitted to describe how we're feeling about the state of Asian Pacific America today. And I'll just read some of the top level words, complicated, frustrated, angry, hurt, scared, determined, fighting, power, loving, regression, forgiving, direction. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for, uh, for, for weighing in on this. Um, and let you know what to expect uh, in the coming weeks. Um, next Friday, we're gonna be exploring the history of discrimination and violence against Asian Pacific Americans. As we all know, our community has been there before. And as the saying goes, if you don't understand history, we are doomed to repeat it. So we wanna have this conversation really as a way to look for patterns and themes, just as we are doing with this word cloud. Uh, as we chart a path forward. I hope that you'll join us next week and don't miss out on the conversation. Please sign up at riseapa.org and please email us if you have thoughts or ideas about voices, uh, strategies, what we should be talking about next. Yulene? Yeah, and I just wanted to say again, um, just like David, how, how we need to acknowledge the voices that spoke out today. Um, we can't do without your stories. And, and this is why, you know, when we're asking constantly, like, what can we do today to make things a little bit more, um, you know, heard. I think we have to support our APA organizations and we need to support the folks who are working on this issue. And we need to make sure that we're helping our communities to thrive every day, day to day and, and empower folks to be able to stand up. And I just wanted to amplify, um, cause I love amplification that the Asian Pacific Fund, it's a community foundation committed to improving the lives of APAs in California's Bay Area and API data. It's a national publisher of demographic data and policy research have, um, they have teamed up to host a fundraising campaign and it's called Give in May, which is APA Heritage Month. So go to giveinmay.org and we're gonna make sure that it's in our chat to learn about organizations serving APAs all across the country and please consider supporting their mission. Um, if we're not supporting our organizations who are doing the work on the ground and who are helping to make sure that day to day we can have places to go and places to report some of the things that are going on, then uh, we, we are not doing our own groundwork and not supporting organizations that are actually supporting us. So I want to thank everyone for being willing to, um, you know, give that a little bit of a plug. So thank you so much. And um, David, I just want you to, uh, you know that uh, it's been it's been an honor hosting this with you. <laughs> and again, I just want to thank all of you who have joined us for tonight um, from the East Coast to the West Coast and the Heartland. Uh, thank you for joining this first town hall series. <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same bat channel, Friday, uh, 5 p.m. East Coast time, 8 p.m. Sorry, 
<laughs> 8 p.m. East Coast time, 5 p.m. West Coast time, and all the times in between. Uh, please help us in spreading the word about Rise Asian Pacific America, because darn it, that's what we're going to do. Peace out.